Okay, hello everyone. Uh, how are you? We've heard about some brilliant powers today, right? The power to read our minds or other people's minds, the power to draw, the power to observe beauty in, in people. Uh, I'm going to talk about a power that's uh, a little bit more down to earth, but definitely no less important than the other ones. It's the power over our money and our cities. And the reason why I'm going to talk about it is because I believe that, well, we have kind of lost control over these two things these days. To explain what I mean, I'm going to give you three examples, three pieces of news from the last 12 months, which I think are quite related and quite alarming at the same time. So first, as you probably know, around Europe, a number of European states had their powers temporarily suspended by, for instance, some international institutions like uh, the so-called Troika. So these states were forced to use the citizens' money to support not the citizens, but the bankrupting banks. On the national level, in our very own country, uh, our government decided to sustain, to maintain the so-called OFE, one of the only systems in the world, uh, pension systems that are privatized. This means that whether we like it or not, our future pensions are in the hands of private companies, which can invest this money however they like. This means they can take financial risks, and the results are rather disastrous. In 2011, these companies generated a total loss of 13 billion zloty, and they need public money to be, well, to survive. So, again, our money is used, but we're not really asked about it. And on the city level, well, as you all know, I guess, Europe 2012 organized here last year. So, again, it probably contributed to the image of the city, but it definitely contributed to its debt. Public money, our money was spent. We were not really asked about it, were we? It is as if the decision makers of today and us, citizens, live on two different planets. We rarely communicate between each other, and when we do, we use different languages. We are very reluctant to listen to each other or to learn from each other. Of course, someone could say that this is all right. I mean, the decision makers out there are our representatives on the decision-making planet, right? We elect heads of states, members of parliament, city councillors, and we let them do their job, right? We go on with our lives. We, maybe some, some of us are interested in partaking in these decisions or capable of making them, but, well, most of us aren't. The problem is, however, that the distance between these two planets is increasing. And the number of crucial decisions that are made, taken today are taken not in bodies that we well, elect, but the bodies that we have absolutely no influence over, like the European Commission, the International Monetary Fund, or our, our, very, our very own government, the members of which we never elect. We elect people that then elect the members of these institutions. The chain is much longer than before. The distance is much bigger. But imagine there was a system that made these two planets much closer, that brought the decision makers and the citizens much closer to, to each other and forced them, or well, encouraged them to cooperate. Well, we are very far from creating this system, and that's a fact. But there is already a practice on the city level which could play a very important role in creating this system. And this practice is called participatory budgeting. Well, it's a rather complicated name, but it basically means that people participate, hence participatory, in creating the city's budget, hence the budgeting, to make it a little bit easier to you know, for me to say and for you to memorize it, I'll be using an acronym PB. It's a bit easier. So it basically means that the people can contribute to the decision making of, of the, well, concerning the budgets. They can co decide how part of the city's money is spent, what is built, what is invested in, etc., etc. Okay, great idea. You might be asking, how does it work? Well, of course, there are differences from city to city, and there are many models that you can follow, but four general stages can be distinguished. Stage number one, people make general rules, establish general priorities, and, well, choose coordinators. Guys that are out there to lead the whole process, to facilitate it, that's probably a better word. And the coordinators then go on to special meetings, at which they meet members of the administration, and the magic moment happens, these two planets, well, meet each other. The members of the administration share their knowledge about the city, and the coordinators, the you know, usual citizens, they share their empirical knowledge about the city. So, for example, the members of the administration show the people the plans for the city and, well, the people tell them how it actually is to live in the city. Well, kind of important, too. Stage number two means that people define the precise needs. For example, they say, well, we need a school to be built or we need a sewage system to be installed. But immediately these needs are transformed into precise projects. So not only people say, well, we need this, we need that, we need that but they also learn how much it costs, who is responsible for building it, and how long it takes before it's done. In stage number three, people, using the priorities established in stage number one, select, the, proced select the, the projects, right? So we choose what's more important for us than, than other things, right? 
step number four, well, it's basically doing it. So from project and plan, we go into reality. We basically build things, organize things. We see the effect. We see the result of our own debate and discussion. The important thing here is that it's not just a one-time event. It's a cycle. And the cycle is repeated year by year. So it allows for a continuous debate, not just one time event, but a continuous debate between the decision makers and citizens as equal partners in the discussion. This allows for influencing not only the two planets, but actually changing, or, well, contributing to a change of the whole system of managing a city. This means that the city develops and functions in a better way. And there's some empiric proof for it. In Porto Alegre, the city which started PB back in the 90s, after a, a little bit over a decade of using PB, they managed to increase or improve access to education, healthcare, and public housing. And not even, it's, well, it's just one element of that. Even more importantly, they simply became a richer city, increasing by nearly a half the income of, from taxes to the municipal budget. So they had even more money to spend, even more money to invest to satisfy people's needs, the citizens' needs, right? Okay, well, no wonder many cities around the world got inspired by this story and wanted to do the same thing at their place. So PBS got immensely popular. Nearly 1,500 cities around the world are using this initiative now or have used it in the past. 200 of these cities are in Europe, and yes, by the end of this or next year, 20 of these cities will be in Poland. Wrocław is one of them, by the way. But if you think that each of these 1,500 cities is actually trying or managing to repeat the Porto Alegre success story, unfortunately, you'd be wrong. And that's what I'm researching. I'm basically looking what actually travels under the label participatory budgeting, what actually comes from South America to Europe, and you know, how does it compare to what they did out there. Um, to do so, I, well, I distinguish some features that I look for in PB. The more features a particular case has, the more capable it is of changing the city and giving people control over their public money, or their money. Um, and to explain it a little bit easy for you, since we don't have a lot of time, I would like to compare PB to a little plant. Well, like a plant needs watering, so like a plant, PB needs also kind of water. It needs support from both the citizens and the decision makers. So in the flower pot, we would put some fundamentals, right? Some it's actually five criteria that define what participatory budgeting is and what it isn't, right? It differentiates it from anything else, any other practice that is out there. The first flower is about the context. Each petal, there's four of them in this case, represents one particular feature. The next flower is about the process. There's nine features there, nine petals. The third one is about the results that PB can or, well, may or may not produce. So, well, this is, and I basically want you, want, you, want you to get a general picture. This is the ideal PB. Right? The plan is beautiful, three flowers, petals are complete, the fly pot is nice too. That's how it looks in Porto Alegre. It looked like for the first uh, over a dozen of years. So it was great. I mean, it really did work, as I showed you as well. The empiric evidence was there. How does it look like in other cities? Well, as I said, it varied from city to city. Right? So, for example, in the Spanish city of Cordoba, in the south of Spain, it looked pretty good as well. I mean, the flower is there. Most of the features were there. It managed to, to achieve something. In the first city, the first Polish city to have experimented with PB, it doesn't look that good, does it? <laughs> um, do you want to know how, do, how, do, how it looks in Wrocław? Not good at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, well, herein lies a challenge, because uh, this city, the, the city as an administration, promised to its citizens that PB will happen not only this year, but also in the next year and in the, year, the years to come. So the challenge is to change the rules. The initiative is good, and the idea is very good too. It works, but it works only if you include these different features. If you make the plant look what a plant should look like, right? And you should also make PB look what, sh what PB should look like. And the challenge is to you, because the more perspectives are represented at the negotiations, if I can call it this way, with the city, the more perspectives are there, the more organizations are there, the more of you are there putting pressure on the city to make the rules, the real rules, the more, like, the more likely it is for participatory budgeting to really influence our city, to basically give you power to decide, to co-decide what Wrocław will be like in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and years to come. So, join the debate. Thanks very much.